one of the first things I noticed when I walked into a Norwegian classroom, actually, was they still have a lot of classrooms that have a, uh, a foot-high platform at the front with the teacher's desk on it, uh, and then the students are foot down from everyone else, which uh, uh, just a great example of how certain ways of thinking about education get coded into classroom layouts, right, where they, you, know, they, you have to go up a step to talk to the teacher, and the teacher has this podium to, to stand on, right, to speak from, that sort of elevates them above the class, which uh, you know, tends to... to historically assume a kind of a broadcast from the front sort of, uh, sort of pedagogy. So, well, yeah. if you had a million dollars and you, had, you could do whatever you want, what sort of classroom would you design? Um, probably wouldn't need a million dollars, um, but uh, I, w I would just go for one that has maximum flexibility. Right? I need to be able to do different things at different times. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes having everyone's attention and explaining the same thing to everybody is the way to go. Sometimes having students work in twos, threes, fours, fives is the way to go. Um, sometimes dividing the class into two groups and having to work on two things and then cross-fertilize. Uh, sometimes I want students to work in groups and then have one person from each group go around and become an emissary to the next group uh, and rotate round. So basically for me, any time the furniture is stopping me from doing what I want to do next pedagogically, then the furniture's not helping. Uh, so I need to be able to, uh, what I'd like to be able to do when I'm planning teaching um, is actually start from what's going to help learning happen and, and not start from where the furniture has to be uh, and, then, and then say, okay, what's, what's going to help this kind of learning and then be able to, to, in two minutes, because realistically if it can't be done in two minutes, I'm not going to do it on the days when I have a headache. Uh, you know, can I move the classroom into a configuration or can I get the students to move it into a configuration that's going to help me get where I'm going? I've heard you say that once you had students sitting on the floor yeah. of a classroom, and it darkened. What, why was that? Well, I was teaching a course, um, and again, I should put in here, this was a, this was a university level course, and I, I, the students were, were seniors, so I had, there was some history there. There were some classes I wouldn't try this particular class with, but uh, I had to teach a course on 20th century German literature. It started in 1945, and, uh, and so the first thing we're learning about is German writers immediately after the Holocaust, immediately after World War II who are trying to figure out how to write poetry, how to write short stories, how to write novels, when the German language has been tainted by 12 years of Nazi propaganda, when everything's bombed flat, when if you write poems about snow, people are going to think of Stalingrad, not Christmas, um, when Buchenwald now no longer means a beech forest, it's the name of a concentration camp, right? How do you, and, and how do you even feel like writing is a valid thing in, when, when people are trading Persian rugs for sacks of potatoes, right? Who wants a book of poetry at this point? So it's a really hard thing to be a writer at this moment in time. And I taught this class a couple of times. In my first class, I had this great lecture that laid out a more detailed version of what I've just summarized to you. I had pictures, I had quotes from German authors, I had a nice PowerPoint. And what started to nag at me a little bit was that um, what we were doing together, you know, I was being the professor up front, I knew stuff. The students were sitting in a brightly lit classroom over their notes, writing things down. And we were talking about these people in this very difficult historical situation. And we were doing our mastery thing, right? You know, we get this, it gets us grades. You know, this, 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 this story gives us educational success, gives us good GPAs, going to help us get into grad school. And um, it just felt like the wrong posture. So I started thinking about how do, I, um, uh, how do I take students who like five minutes earlier were walking down the corridor talking about pizza and last night's football scores and, and so on and, and take us to like five minutes later talking about German writers in 1945 without sitting in this position of smug superiority, you know, where we know that the Nazis were wrong, we know that, that we were right, you know, etc. Um, how do I get some decentering? How do I get some humility, right? It's part of what I started thinking I was after. And so one Easter, I was sitting in our church, and we had a tenebrae service at church where you go through a sequence where you gradually snuff out candles until just the Christ candle is left. And then on Good Friday evening, the Christ candle is snuffed out until it's relit on Easter morning. And, and, I, and uh, we'd adopted the practice in our church of sitting on the floor during the tenebrae service. And it got really uncomfortable over an hour, and that was part of the point um, during a Good Friday service. And I thought um, this would work for the Holocaust. So uh, when I started teaching, I started to teach that where I would come to class early, uh, remove all the furniture or stack it against the back wall, get rid of the chairs some way, um, darken the room, black it out as dark as I could possibly get it. Uh, I had a PowerPoint looping on the screen that had just a series of photographs of bombed out houses, bombed out cityscapes, uh, concentration camps, right, images from the end of World War II. I had some um, 
kind of ominous ambient music out of my experimental electronic music collection. Uh, kind of like almost kind of horror movie kind of music, but you know, it's a little unsettling, a little, little dissonant. Had that playing on the computer in the background. I put a sign on the door saying, please enter in silence. And I deliberately showed up four minutes late for class. Um, or I, I hung, around just around, hung, hung out just around the corner. So I come into class and I've got, you know, my students are sitting on the floor in a dark room with this unsettling music going on and pictures of bummed out houses and so on. And I turn the music down and I sat down on the floor with them and I say, it's Germany, it's 1945. What does it feel like? And they start giving me single words, you know, it feels dark, depressing, scary. I say, okay, it's Germany, it's 1945 and you're a writer. What are you going to write about? And... Sometimes they start trying to give me bright ideas, right? And, and I start shooting them down, right? Well, oh, you'd, you'd, write about, you'd write about the war. Seriously? Do you think people living here want to read about the war right now? Oh, okay. So, so you'd write about, like, hopeful things, good things, right? Really? People ready for that right now? Right? Just turn the page in the middle of the rubble. Do you think that's going to fly? And we gradually work through this. You know, there's no paper. There's no publishing houses. Who wants to read stuff by Germans right now? Right? Um, and they gradually just get a sense of what's going on in this social setting. So I've had students say to me at the end of that hour, that was the most compelling hour I ever spent in a, in a classroom. Um, and by the end of it, we're really physically uncomfortable, right? We're sitting on the floor. Uh, and again, that's part of the point. Um, and, and so, you know, it kicks off a semester. The rest of that semester, I structured the whole course around the question of when you read a text by someone else as a Christian, how do you read it with humility, patience, charity and justice, right? How, how do you read it? Not assuming you're smarter than the author, even if the author's a foreigner. Um, how do you read it? Not, you know, thinking well of the author for as long as possible, being charitable. How do you read it patiently enough that you can slow down and really get what's there and not just do your quick judgment on it? And how do you do justice to the text um, and not read what you think you're reading? And so how do we slow ourselves down enough to, uh, to really see what's there? So all through the semester, I was looking for ways of using the learning environment to try to foster attention to those virtues. Um.